Amen. So keep your place in Luke chapter 16, bookmark that, and head over to Matthew chapter 5, if you would. Um, that will be the, the basis of our sermon in Matthew chapter 5, and then we're going to go through one of these stories in uh, Luke chapter 16 to uh, make a couple of my points. But the title of the sermon tonight um, is Keeping Your Word, and the importance of keeping your word, and how, what the Bible says about that. Look at Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus actually addresses um, this very thing. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Now, Jesus, when he talked about things in the law, many times, oh, every time, the Pharisees misunderstood the things that he was saying, like he was changing the law, or like he was, you know, negating the law. When really Jesus was just fulfilling the law, he was many times correcting um, what the Pharisees had been, you know, had twisted the law into. And Matthew chapter 5 is a perfect example of this. I want you to remember the title of the sermon is keeping your word, because that phrase um, is used a lot today, um, and I'm going to show you how, you know, that's, that phrase is actually part of the problem and when it comes to how we think about the things that we say, the things that we tell people we will do, what we will not do, and how important it is. Um, it's much more important than just keeping our word. Look down at Matthew chapter 5, and look at what Jesus says in verse 33. The Bible says, again, Ye have heard that it had been said of them of old time, that thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst, make, canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatever is more than these cometh of evil. So a lot of people say, you know, okay, Jesus is just saying, a lot of people just like surface read what Jesus is saying here. Jesus, a lot of people will say, well, Jesus is just, he's preaching against oaths or vows as the Old Testament of old time, the people of old time would call vows in the Bible. But Jesus here is saying, he's like, don't swear by all these things. First of all, he's like, don't swear by heaven. Don't swear by you know, Jerusalem, the city of the great king. He's like, these things aren't even yours. He's like, why would you be swearing by things that aren't even yours? He's like, just don't, you know, forswear yourself. Don't be swearing these vows that shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Look, he's saying, you should still perform your oaths, is what he's saying. But he's like, you shouldn't have to go and say, like, you know, I swear by my mother's right eye, you know, for someone to believe you. You know, a, a, a thousand needles in my eye. or what, I'm trying to remember all the dumb things that we used to say, you know, in grade school or whatever, like just to, to like really show somebody you're serious, right? Really show somebody that you are going to be credible when it comes to what you're saying. You know, I, I you know, all these different things. People see, he's like, Jesus is just like, just do what you say you're going to do in the first place. It's much simpler than just that. All right, so look, none of these things, swearing by heaven, look, it's even worse to swear by heaven, swear by God, swear by, you know, um, spiritual things, you know, things like this. It's even worse to do that. Look, Jesus is just saying your word, the words that you say you will do should be good enough. All right, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 23. He's not negating De Deuteronomy chapter 23 or anywhere else that the Bible talks about vows. He's just saying, like, look, there should be not this necessary, you know, overly swearing by all these crazy things in order to do things. Look at verse 21 of Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy chapter 23, look at verse 21. Deuteronomy 23, verse 21. The Bible says, talking about just the seriousness of vowing, you know, saying, or, you know, vowing, taking an oath, promising that you're going to do something. The Bible says, when thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God... Thou shalt not slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God shall surely require it of thee, and it would not, and it would be sin in thee. If you underline things in your Bible, just underline to pay, and then I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. But the Bible says, but if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. So the Bible here is saying, like, if you promise something to God, if you take a vow to God, it's serious that you do that thing. He's like, but if you don't make that promise, then there's no sin there. All right, look at verse 23. That which has gone out of thy lips, thou shalt keep and perform, even a free will offering, according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. 
I, I find it interesting, I'm going to show you that in Luke chapter 16, that he ties taking a vow to, you know, offering things um, to the Lord, offering material things, whether that be, you know, money or an animal or any kind of, you know, offering of a personal possession to the Lord. I'll tie that in in a little bit. But it's interesting because if you look at Proverbs chapter 20, you turn to Matthew chapter 26. It's interesting because people will do this to you too. They will require, the Bible actually says in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 25, that so Jesus is warning against like swearing against heaven and swearing against all these things. Jesus is saying, this should not be necessary for you to do this is what Jesus is saying. But the Bible also says that people that re will require you to do this are evil people. In Proverbs 20 and verse 25, you're going to Matthew chapter 26, and I'm going to show you some evil people that did that to Jesus, actually. But look at, um, in Proverbs chapter 20 and 25, I'll read to you. The Bible says this. It says, It is a snare to the man who devoureth that which is holy, and after vows to make inquiry. So it's saying, look, it's, it's something, somebody's trying to devour things that make holy, somebody that is trying to, you know, get you to take vows to tell the truth. You're in, they're interrogating you, and they're saying, swear by heaven or swear by God. And you're saying, what kind of wicked people would do something like that? Well, look at Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, look at verse number 63. Saying that evil people, look, you should not do this, and it's an evil person that will require you to do this as well. Look at verse number 63. But Jesus held his peace. Jesus is at this trial, if you want to call it a trial, before his crucifixion, he's been arrested, and he's being, you know, interrogated here. And he, Jesus held his peace, and the high priest, he's not speaking to these people, and they're trying to get him to talk, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God. He's like, I charge you by God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. He basically puts this, you know, this vow statement on Jesus. He's like, I charge you by God, I adjure you, you know, to swear basically by God who you are. Are you the Christ? And then Jesus answered, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said. So much for Jesus never claiming to be Christ. I mean, he just said it right there. All right. Thou hast said, nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So the point is, don't let anyone do that to you either. You know, don't let anyone say, like, you know, swear by God or I charge you to... Swear by God, this and this and this, because just let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. And Jesus is saying, swear not at all. What he's saying is, look, you, got, you really got three choices when it comes to, you know, committing to something or not. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 23, look, if you don't commit to anything, it's like, whatever. Hey, so you got three choices. Somebody's like, you know, coming out and saying, well, I need this or whatever, and you just you got three choices. You, got, like, you can be silent, swear not at all. Or you could say yes and mean yes, or you could say no and mean no. That's what Jesus is getting at in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus was not changing the law. He was fixing what man twisted it into being. As we see in the Old Testament, we see people swearing stupid vows, vows to commit murder against their own daughter, Jephthah, in Judges. You know, and they took the vow, you know, take a vow so seriously, because look, if Jephthah swore the vow, you know, there's, you know there's situations in your life, and you know you see this in the, in the ministry, unfortunately, where people come to you and like any way they turn is sin. Like they've gotten themselves into such a pickle. You know, you ever play pickle in baseball where you get a guy stuck between the two bases? You know, you're in a pickle there. You're going to get out either way unless somebody makes a mistake. But you get yourself in such a pickle in your life that any way you turn is sin. So what do you do? Well, if you have the doctrine of all sin is equal, you're in real trouble here. But the point is, Jephthah got himself into trouble in Judges. He swore a vow that he would sacrifice the first thing that came out of his house. If God, and he swore this vow by God. He swore this vow, and the first thing that comes out of his house is his daughter. So if he breaks that vow, yeah, that's a sin. Because he shouldn't have swore the vow. It was a dumb vow. But, or he could commit murder, which is what he did. Unfortunately, but you know, I mean, we should, you know, either way is sin, but you know, break the vow, confess the vow, and please don't murder your daughter, all right? I mean, the point is, is that vows are serious, and you could see how serious they took it in, I mean, if the story of Jephthah tells us nothing else, it tells us that vows were taken seriously 
by people at that time, all right? Even to the point of, you know, horrible, you know, horrible sin that people went into because of it. Go to Numbers chapter 30. Go to Numbers chapter 30. So Jesus was not changing the law. He's just like, quit doing all this stuff. Quit. I mean, I, I don't think God was very happy that somebody swore by God or swore by heaven and then committed murder, you know, in the name of keeping a vow to God. God is not happy about that. Go to Numbers chapter 30 and look at verse uh, number 2. Numbers chapter 30. The Bible is so serious about vows that it even gives some specific rules, you know, about vows for, you know, a, a man, a woman, a daughter. The Bible says if a man, in verse 2, if a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. In Numbers chapter 30, it talks about, it gives incredible detail about vows. It says if a daughter, you know, vows a vow, and, and she doesn't talk to her father about it, who is in charge of his daughter, that the father can nullify that vow. The same thing goes for the wife. If the wife swears a vow, and, you know, the husband was not aware of that vow, it's very interesting, though, because it says the husband must nullify it that same day. So the husband can't be like, now, I thought it was a good vow last week, but now I don't think, no, because now it's on the charge of the husband at that point. It comes upon him, all right? So, look, I almost did this to my wife one time. She went on some diet two years ago that I felt was wrecking our marriage because I couldn't have dessert anymore, you know, because I'm not going to eat dessert by myself. That's lame. I'm just kidding. I didn't nullify the vow, but the point is, the point is that husbands had the ability to nullify the vow, but that same day. And they could nullify over their daughters as well. Okay, but the point is that, that God puts serious rules in place and vows are to be taken seriously. Your word, is what I'm trying to convince you tonight, I'm going to give you two points tonight. I'm going to give you two points that will benefit you for keeping your word. And if you're just going to be like, I'm going to be the person to keep my word, this, these are two things that will benefit you tonight. All right, that's the whole point of the sermon. The first one is this. Okay, so I'm trying to convince you to be the type of person that their yay is yay and their nay is nay tonight, all right? Or even a person that just is silent at times, all right? So two things. Point number one is this, and this is where we're going to go to Luke chapter 16. But point number one is this. If you don't keep your word and you're not somebody that keeps your word, and I'm talking about even small things. This is a tough thing, you know, about your word is like small things will really damage your credibility, even like little tiny things, the smallest things. Here's the thing. The first point is this. No one will rely on you if you are not somebody that can keep your word. If you're the kind of person that's just always saying, hey, I'll be there, or hey, I'll do that, or, you know, and you say they're just little things, and when it comes to actually being there and doing that, they're little things, and you let those things go. The credibility loss is still the same, is what you need to understand. And credi credibility loss, it happens quickly. Credibility building takes a long time, but credibility loss happens very quickly. So it doesn't take too many of these times for people to just peg you as the type of person that's just like, oh, yeah, he just says stuff. Look, they may not be mad at you. They may not be like, you know, so, I mean, because look, they're probably just going to suffer themselves to be defrauded and be a good Christian brother to you if we're talking about people within the church. But the point is, the credibility loss will be the same. And it doesn't take too many of these times to just take you to zero, basically, where people realize, yeah, he just says stuff. That's just who he is. And here's the thing that will, will really hurt you and that people will not see that are like this. Opportunities will be missed by you that you didn't even know were there. This is the problem. No one will be able to rely on you. People are always, because look, these are opportunities that many people just don't see. Because guess what? People are always looking for people to rely on because there's just not that many of those people. Because many people, they just can't do everything themselves. They just can't, you know, they don't want to do everything themselves. So they need people that they can rely on. Too many people think out there, too many people think, man, I just never get any breaks. Too many people think, like, man, that, that guy over there, he just gets all the breaks. The reason people don't get the breaks is because these opportunities are going by them every single day, and they don't even know that these opportunities are going by them. Now turn to Luke chapter 16. You know, whether that be promotions or just, you know, 
opportunities to help out or become more of a, a prophet in your Christian life. People, I mean, this is what I see. People, they don't see the opportunities that could be right there for them. They're passing them by, and they don't even realize it. All right, look at Luke chapter 16. This is a really interesting story in Luke chapter 16. Maybe one of the most confusing, maybe misunderstood stories that Jesus tells in the Bible. And we're going to look at the story of the unjust steward. I'm going to explain the whole story first, and then I'll apply it. So don't wonder, like, hey, where's he going with this? But I'll explain the whole story first because there's a lot of lessons in this story. All right, and a lot of people are a little confused at this story and the way Jesus puts it forth. It's not the same type of story where you kind of have a good guy and a bad guy, you know, in the Bible. It's a little bit unorthodox when it comes to the types of stories that Jesus tells and the parables that Jesus tells. But let's take a look at it, and let's see what we can take from this. So we're talking about, you know, keeping your word. We're talking about having people rely on you, and we're talking about missed opportunities that you will have in your life if people, you know, don't feel like they can rely on you. And these are opportunities, folks, that it's not like you're going to see the opportunity coming and be like, yeah, I don't really want that opportunity. It's, you're not even going to know the opportunity was there. It's like an invisible opportunity that you're missing. And you have no idea, if you're not somebody that keeps your word, you're not somebody that people can rely on, you have no idea how many of these opportunities you're missing. But I'm telling you, in this day and age, it's a lot. It's a lot. Look at Luke chapter 16, verse number 1. Let's look at the story of the unjust steward. And he said, first of all, who's he talking to? He's talking to the disciples. That's important. Okay, so he's talking to the disciples. He said unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him, and he said, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer be steward. So this is his accountant, or the person that's taking care of his money. And he's like, Hey, he heard a rumor or whatever. He doesn't know if it's credible or not, but he heard a rumor that this guy was, you know, you know, wasting his money, stealing his money, not being a good steward of his money. He's like, hey, show me the books, buddy, is what he says to this steward. Look at verse 3. Then the steward said within himself, <laughs> I mean, obviously, he was not doing a good job because this guy's like, right away, he's like, I got to find a way out. The steward said within himself, what shall I do? So he was clearly being an unjust steward, whether he was stealing or just wasting or whatever it was. He says, what shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg. I am ashamed. So he's like, yeah, I'm busted, basically, is what he says. He's like, I'm busted. And like what he does next shows that he was guilty of being an unjust steward altogether. But he's like, I can't work for a living. <laughs> he's got one of these jobs where he's like, you know, just on the internet all day or whatever, you know, but he's just like, he doesn't, he doesn't want to work for a living. And then he's like, I'm not going to beg. That's embarrassing because he's obviously living a pretty decent lifestyle uh, off this other guy's money. So he's going to come up with a plan to get himself out of this. All right. And it's, you know, it's a fairly brilliant plan. Look at verse number four. I am resolved what to do that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So you should underline into their houses, if you write in your Bible, and I'll explain that later. So he's got a plan. He's figured this out. I know what I'm going to do. He's like, I'm about to get canned. I got this thing figured out. So he must like have a two weeks period here where he's got some time. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, how much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, an hundred measures of oil. And he said, take the bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, How much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take thy bill and write fourscore, meaning 80. This is a modern day politician right here. What he's doing is he's going out to all these people and he is stealing from his boss to give these people money to cut their debts down, cut them in half or whatever. So when he gets fired, he will be in good favor with them. This is politics right here. This, let me just tell you something, without going off for 45 minutes. This happens everywhere. Everywhere. Every business this happens in, this happens all over the place. People, you know, greasing the palms of people here and there, so when they know when they retire or whatever, they got a nice cushy place to go. Politicians do it all the time. You know, they get lobbied by big companies, and then pretty soon after they're done being a politician because people are sick of them or whatever, 
you know, they go off and they work on the board of directors for that big company. Huh, how's that work? How do you think politicians that make $200,000 a year end up, you know, multi, you know, billionaires, some of them? This, this, this is exactly what's happening, what Jesus is saying here. Okay, now that's not really the point of the sermon, but just you understand, like, the brilliance is God speaking here. God's like, this is how men work. This is what this unjust steward is doing. This happens everywhere. Today, I've seen it for 23 years. It just happens all the time. All right? Go to verse number 8. Now, it gets a little confusing. So that's easy to understand why he's doing that, right? So far, everything's easy to understand. He's trying to make a nice, soft landing for himself, and he gets fired from this job because he knows he's guilty. And he's obviously a dirtbag. He's just stealing this guy's money. He doesn't care. Look at verse 8. This is the first confusing statement right here, verse number 8, that people get a little tripped up on. And the Lord commended the unjust steward. You're like, what? Because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. So look, neither, neither of these guys are really decent people here. Right? The Lord just, I mean, the Lord, this is the guy whose money he's given away. He's like, hey, that was pretty brilliant what you did there. You know, even though he took his own money to do it, he's just like, hey, that was kind of a brilliant thing. And then it says this statement that, you know, some people get a little confused about where it says, the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Who are the children of light? It's us. We're the children of light. We're the saved. We're the people that are following Jesus Christ. The children of this world, it's just the unsaved people. There's people that aren't saved, right? So look, it's not that it's, it's saying that they're reprobates. It's just saying they're the children of the world. That, that's it. Right? They're children of the world. But it says, notice these three words where it says, in their generation. So it's talking about the children of this world. And then Jesus is really going to explain this in like detail in the next coming verses. But it's just talking about they aren't eternally wise. It doesn't say they're eternally wise. It says in this world, they're wise. This is why. This is why, and I used to think about this when I was, when I was younger. I mean, I don't think about it now because, like, I know the answer. But, you know, you ever wonder why, man, why can't there just be, like, a saved Christian billionaire? Just think, like, a saved Christian billionaire that could, like, just, like, give a bunch of resources and money to a bunch of gospel-preaching churches that could just go out and just take all those resources and just, just take the gospel out to the world. I mean, just why? First of all, that's just wrong thinking in general, because we don't need resources, we need people. We need harvesters, right? We need manpower is what we need. We don't need money. And Jesus actually explains that in the coming verses. But he's saying, like, this is just, this is just an explanation for us why the Christian is really just going to never, it's almost never Christians. I don't want to say never, but it's almost never Christians that you're going to see at those top echelons of the world. Because we don't really care about the money, or we're not supposed to, anyway. It's not our main goal. And like people like that, people like this unjust steward, his main goal was just to, how am I going to keep myself in this money? How am I going to keep myself in this lifestyle? So he goes out, and he does a good job of doing that. So look, in his generation, he's wiser. Because the Christian just isn't going to think of something like that, because... They just don't care about the money. That's not even the main point. Look at verse number 9. So that's just, it's talking about the children of this world are just going to be more wise in the things of this world. Because we're not of this world. We shouldn't care about the things of this world. But the, this is a second confusing point right here where Jesus says this. Now the story's done. The story's done and now Jesus is talking. Okay, Jesus is talking to the disciples. Look what he says. And I say unto you, remember at the beginning of the chapter, he's talking to the disciples. He says, I say unto you, and this is where you need to know, like the ye's and the yourselves and the they's in this verse is super important right here on who Jesus is saying what to. Look what he says. He says, and I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness that when ye fail they may receive you into everlasting habitations. You're like, what in the world? What's that all about? So Jesus here is saying to the disciples, he's saying, hey, why don't you go out and do a similar thing? First of all, who's he talking to? He's talking to the disciples. That's the ye. That's the yourselves. Right? He's talking to a group of people, plural. Ye, yourselves, the Y words are plural. 
these and thou's are singular. He's saying, why don't you use your money to make friends too, is what he's saying. But look what he says. He says, use the mammon of unrighteousness. The same, the same, it's not mammon that came from unrighteousness. He's just saying like this mammon of unrighteousness, just this money. This money in this world. Why don't you take the money that you have in this world and you make friends too. But there's a difference with your friends. There's a difference with your friends. Because I told you to underline those verses, right? Or those words in verse number four. What verses did I, where was this guy making, where was this guy hoping to be brought in? In verse number four. He was hoping to be brought in into their houses. Where, I mean, that's not everlasting. He's talking about just taking care of himself in this world, is what he's talking about. But your friends that will receive you will be with you in eternity, the Bible is saying here. It says they will receive you into everlasting. It's like they're going to, your friends, you should take your money and make friends that are going to bring you into everlasting homes. Is there any home on this earth that's everlasting? So think about this for a second. You've got to really like, crank this one through. What kind of friends are these that you're making? Jesus is saying, you know, look, this is somebody who saves up his money, and instead of putting it in stocks and bonds, this is somebody who saves up his money and goes on a mission trip. This is what Jesus is talking about. These are the everlasting habitations that you are going to make for yourself with that money. And you know what you're going to do? You know what, you know what your pile of money is going to do? It's going to shrink. <laughs> so, so, but guess what? Your pile of friends and your everlasting habitations is going to grow. This is what Jesus is talking about when he talks about, turn to Matthew chapter 6. Look, mission trips aren't cheap. Think about this. Mission trips aren't cheap, and if you just save up your money and save up your money and go on every mission trip you possible can, look, you're probably going to fail a little bit at, at growing that money. You're growing that big pile. This is the opposite. This is, a, this is an opposites lesson, this unjust steward for us Christians. It's an opposites lesson. This is the opposite of what the unjust steward was doing. Jesus is saying, you shouldn't care about your money. Instead, use your money that you don't care about to make everlasting friends. He was, he was caring about the money and making friends now, is what this guy was doing. So he'd have a house to go to now. Instead of using this mammon, this money, to further God's kingdom. Which is what Jesus is telling the disciples to do. And look, that'll look like, I'm telling you, that'll look like financial failure to the world. That's what Jesus said, when ye fail. It'll look like financial failure to the world. But in reality, look at Matthew chapter 6. In reality, it's not failure at all. Because Jesus explains it, he decodes it in Matthew chapter 6, because you're still laying up treasures. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, he says, Lay not, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moss and rust, rust doth corrupt, or where thieves break through and steal. He's like, hey, don't pile up money down here. He's like, don't pile up things that can just be stolen. We were out soul winning today, and like we walked by this yard, and I told the guys we were walking by, I was like, Man, if I was a billionaire, they had this dog in this yard. You should have seen this dog. The dog was like, the, the dog had crawled out of hell. And it was just like, it's drooled. And it was making noises I can't even try to explain to make. This dog was just, Bleh. I was like, man, if I was, a, if I was a billionaire, I'd take all my money out in $20 bills. I'd stack it in that backyard right there. And I'd just have that dog and I'd never have a problem. But look, all your money can be stolen. Everything can be stolen from you. All the things that you're storing up on this earth, that story had nothing to do with the sermon. It can all be stolen from you. He says, instead, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, nor where thieves do break through and steal. And then it, he matches this up to the lesson in the unjust story. He says, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So Jesus is saying, look, you, look, you go out and you spend all your money on the mission trips. You spend all your money to just further the kingdom of God. You spend all your money to make eternal friends, to just, like, hey, my, my goal in my life is to get people saved. So all the resources that God gives me, it, I'm going to use that to get people saved. And look, you're not going to be broke if you do that. I'm going to explain that to you in just a few minutes. You're not going to be broke if you do that. But here's the thing Jesus is saying is that's what you should be doing with that unrighteous mammon. Right? I mean, he's, look, he's talking about trading in, trading in. Think about this. 
It's, he, D, Jesus is talking about the deal of a lifetime. Trade in Federal Reserve notes for souls. It's like that's the, that's the biggest deal ever is what Jesus is explaining here. Go back to Luke chapter 16. See, this guy didn't care about this money because it wasn't his. He didn't care about it. But you shouldn't care about yours either. So Jesus caps it right here in verse number 10. Verse number 10. Verse number 10 and verse number 11 are really the key here. Look what he says in verse number 10. It says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. And here's the opposites verse right here for us. He says, Therefore, ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon who will commit to your trust the true riches. So this guy, this guy, this unjust steward was not faithful in his boss's money, but for the Christian, the test on whether or not we are faithful in the unrighteous mammon is whether we don't care about it. It's the opposite. This guy didn't care about it, and he was supposed to care about it. We're not supposed to care about it because the true riches are the gospel. And Jesus is saying, Here's the test for you, Christian. The test for you, Christian, is if you care about this money, I'm not going to entrust you with the gospel. Where instead, this guy, you know, he cared about the unrighteous mammon, and nobody would put, it, put him in charge with more. But with us, you just flip it on its head, and the test for us is, hey, you got to not care about it. And then, I'll trust you with the gospel, is what Jesus says. He's like, hey, use all that garbage. To go make, make eternal differences for people. And you see that all the time. People see people saving up. Can't wait to go to another mission trip. Can't wait to do this. Can't wait to help out here. You know, we're going to go win, get more people saved. Like, that's the whole point is what Jesus is saying. It's the opposite. That's the test for us is not caring about the money. Now, here's the main point. Back to the sermon's point. Jesus says, look at verse 12. If you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? In the unjust steward's case, it was mammon versus more mammon. That's the application there. If he would have, tr if he would have been trustworthy with his boss's mammon, he would have gotten more mammon. But with us, it's mammon versus the gospel. We have to not care about the mammon. It will be entrusted with the gospel. That's what Jesus is saying. All right, now look, now we can apply this to keeping your word. Now we can apply this to getting more responsibility from people. Because if people can't trust in you, they can't rely on you. You see where I'm going with this? They can't rely on you for anything, but just take it from money to things that you say. It's the same application. And as a matter of fact, the way Jesus talks, the way God talks about vows and the things that you say, it's a direct correlation with money and debt. If you don't take your vows or your words seriously, no one is going to trust you with more anything. God, people, all the same. Look back to, go back to verse 13 of Luke 16. And here's the thing. These things, as I said before, you will never know these things. I've had so much hope for people. You know, over the years, I've had so much hope for people. I just see, you see so much potential in people, but it just, it just turn out to be people you just can't rely on. And it's really sad to see. Because you see, you know, that, that hope that you want to have for people. But look at verse 13. No servant, now this just comes right back around to Matthew chapter 6. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You see how that just kind of, it's just an opposites lesson for us? in the un unjust steward, but the unjust steward loved the mammon. Just using money as an example here, that was the small thing. Look, our word is no different than this. If we are not trustworthy, God will never give us more. That's, that's the first point. And look, men operate the same way. If you're not trustworthy, you're saying to yourself, everybody else gets breaks all the time. And I, I just don't seem to get these breaks Look, I'm telling you, people are just waiting to give you responsibility in your life. Anybody you know in authority is looking for anyone. It's not, you know, so look, 
there's trains passing you by that you don't see. So when you think about, I'll be there, I'll do that, things that you say, just remember Jesus' three choices. You can be silent. Silence is an option, folks. You don't know what to say, don't say anything. That's just a good rule for life right there. You don't have any idea what to say. Don't be this guy's like, ah, I got to say something right now. I got to say something. I'll do that or whatever. Silence is an option. All right. I didn't always used to be like that. I had a hard time shutting my mouth when I was in my 20s. But I mean, you get to a certain point where you realize, like, if you don't know exactly what to say, don't say anything. And then if you say yes, it better mean yes. And if you say no, it better mean no. Or opportunities will pass you by. That's point number one. Here's the second one. Here's the second one. Benefits of keeping your word. Benefits to you. I'm trying to convince you to help yourself tonight. Here's the thing. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. If you can't keep your word, covenants will not be possible with you. I say, what, what do you mean? What's that mean? Covenants, what do I mean? Covenants are deals. Covenants are agreements between two parties. Anytime there's a covenant in the Old Testament, there's a covenant in the Bible, you know, God is making, uh, he's making a deal. You know, God had covenants, many covenants, with the nation of Israel. He was making a deal with them. He's saying, you know, hey, I'll do this if you do this. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse number 9. The only way covenants are possible is if both people keep both sides. So covenants with you, if you can't keep your word, covenants are, covenants are worthless. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse number 9. Here's the thing with God, though. We really need to understand how God operates. And then this will help us keep our word. And I think we'll change that phrase before the sermon's over. Because look at what God says in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse number 9. We really need to understand how God operates in covenants. Know, therefore, that the Lord thy God, he is God. The what kind of God? The faithful God which keepeth the covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. So when will God renege on his side of the deal? Never. He will never renege on his side of the deal. You look at the nation of Israel. This is why it's so stupid that people think that like, oh, Israel should have the promised land and they're God's chosen people today. Have you ever read the Bible? It is a covenant. It was a deal. It was a deal. If you keep my commandments, if you don't go after other gods, if you do these things, I will keep you in the land. Over and over and over in the Bible, it was a covenant. A covenant is a deal. And God is faithful. He didn't break his part of the deal. God is faithful. He will never break his part of the deal. Covenants with God are our problem. Totally one-sided. So then, you know, they just completely reject the Messiah, they completely reject Christ, and you're like, oh, God's chosen people, the Israel, what in the world is happening here? It was a covenant, a deal, and deals with God are never broken on the God side, is what God is saying in Deuteronomy chapter 7. It is always the other side that makes a deal. But look, if you're not somebody that keeps your word, a covenant cannot be successfully made with you is what the Bible is saying. Go to Psalm chapter 76. You know how, this is a common saying, keep your word. That's a man that keeps his word. That man, when he says something, he keeps what he says. But that's not what the Bible says about keeping a vow. That is not the language that, that the Bible uses when it talks about keeping a vow. It doesn't even say keeping a vow. Look what it says in Psalm chapter 76 and verse number 11. Psalm chapter 76 and verse number 11. Psalm chapter 76 and verse number 11. The Bible says, vow and keep what you say unto the Lord. It says, vow and pay unto the Lord, your God. Let all that be around him bring presents unto him that be feared. It's actually, look at Job 22. Actually, just go to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I'll read for you Job 22. You're going to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Job chapter 22 and verse number 27 says, thou shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse number 4. And I could read you verse after verse after verse saying the same thing. Ecclesiastes 5 and verse number 4 says, 
when thou vowest a vow unto God, and defer not to what? To pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. You see what, you see what the Bible is, is saying here that a vow is? A vow is something you owe. When you say, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, I'll be there. Yep, I'll help you with that. I don't care what small thing it is. When you say that you will do things, you ever made a promise to God? Now you're all thinking. You're all going through your accounting on all the promises you made to God. And you're like, oh, do I have debts here? The Bible is comparing it to a debt. The Bible is comparing this to that. The book of Psalms says that the wicked borroweth and payeth not again. It's a wicked thing to not pay, especially you owe a debt to God. You, you tell God, as soon as you, as soon as you promise something, you're in debt. You think about things a little different now? Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5 make a little bit more sense now when Jesus is just like, hey, shut up. It's like, stop talking. I mean, what kind of person? This is like a person that goes into, that just goes into any store and they're just like, I'll take everything. <laughs> they're just like, because look, you can borrow anything now. You can take a loan out on anything. Couches, TVs. I, went to, I got my taxes done. I got my taxes done last week, and they want to give me a loan on my tax return. I'm like, are you, are, 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 I, 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 I like short-circuited in my brain, and my ear started smoking. I'm like, you're going to give me a loan. You're offering, so I'm getting this return back in, in seven days, and you're offering to give me a loan and charge me to get my own money that the government did. What? She's like, yeah. Isn't it great? You can take a loan out on anything. But what happens to you? Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. What happens if you're the type of person, because what does the, the Bible say about the borrower owns the lender, right? Something like that? The borrower is servant to the lender. And if you go out and you borrow a bunch of things, and then you don't pay things back, what happens to your credit? Like it goes to nothing, right? Like nobody's going to break your knees in the United States. But your credit, well, maybe some places, I don't know. But, you know, no, you know your credit, your credit, your credibility goes to zero. This is why it's a direct application to the unjust steward. This is why money is a perfect example. This is why God, when he says a vow, he's like, no, you owe. You owe. Because God thinks differently than us. Because God is faithful. See? You're like, we don't understand. It's because you're not faithful. I'm not faithful. We don't think this way, but we need to understand how serious it is to keep our word or pay our vows when we think in the mindset of God. When God's like, every time you say something, you owe debt. Every time, and Jesus is like, just quit taking out credit cards. Matthew chapter 5. We've all made promises to God. I'm writing this sermon, and I'm just like, man, said something that I, do I owe, have an cr outstanding credit card with the Lord? That'd be a good one to 1 John 1, 9. Just kind of blanket statement, 1 John 1, 9, that one. Confess that one. Lord, if I've ever made a promise to you that I haven't kept, Lord, please forgive me. Please help me shut my mouth. Please help me just do what I say I'm going to do. Please help me just be someone that just tries to just not say as much and, and be a person that pays my word. I mean, you call, I mean, what do you call somebody that doesn't pay a debt? A, a thief, right? You know, a, a debtor, a thief. Now look, now apply this to all the relationships in your life. It makes perfect sense how God operates. Turn to John 14 and verse number 15. See, you've got to understand that God operates on action. God doesn't, look, here's the thing. There's a reason that it doesn't say keep your word you know, in the Bible all over the place. It's because God doesn't operate on words. God operates on action. God operates on action. Love is a perfect example of this. You know, love is something that's it's a word that's, that people have, you know, you talk to, I don't care, you talk to 90% of the people that you, you see out soul winning. And if you would ask them, if we would change the questions that we asked and just ask every people that we, let's go out soul winning Wednesday, we're not going to do this, but and just ask, 
people one question, do you love God? I bet you 90% of people would say yes. In this area, anyway. But look at John 14, 15. God, does God care about words, though? Look what Jesus says. Or look what Jesus said. He says, if you love me, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Did he say, if ye say you love me? No, he said, if ye love me, this is what you'll do. He's, he's, you know what he's doing? He's defining what love means here. He's defining what love is. He's not saying like, you know, he's saying these words, love, this is what Jesus is saying. Love is, is this action. That, that's what it means. That's what that verse means. People misuse that so much, it's ridiculous. But the love is action. Without action, without action, the, the word is not the definition of the word. You see what I'm saying? Without action, it doesn't mean what God says it means. Without, without action, look, I mean, did God say, I love you, love you, down there, kiddos? No, God took action. That's how we know God loved us, because he sent Jesus. Because he, he didn't just say, like, hey, love you, sorry about that hell thing, that's going to be rough for you. He's like, no, I love you, here's how I'm getting out of it. And you know I love you, why? Why do I know God loves me? Because he sent Jesus, that's how I know. This is, this, is a, this is the problem with today. This is why it's the same thing, why there's so many failed marriages, why husbands and wives are having so many problems. You know, marriages are just falling apart because love is words. Love is just feelings. You know, love is, is feelings. Well, I, I feel like I love you, you know, and I get butterflies in my stomach when we're, I'm around you and, and all this. And, you know, and, and really I feel like we're really lovey-dovey, you know, and I, you know, but if, look, if it's not a feeling. That's how love turns into lust, which turns into all kinds of whatever you want to define it as, whatever kind of sick, weird stuff that they define it as today. Love is action. It is sacrificial action, or it is not love. A zebra is not an elephant. A nut is not a bolt. A tire is not an engine. I mean, it, it just, we can say that these things are, but it's not what God says. It's like, you love me? Do it. That's what love is. So we can't just redefine words. So look, keeping, you know, every promise to God, you owe debt. Remember that. Because that's how God rolls. God is a God of action. You say something, and you should operate that with people in your lives on this earth, too. You say something, you owe debt on that. I mean, you think about it a little bit different when you look at it that way, don't you? When I just, when I say, when I'm standing in a group of guys, and somebody's talking about, oh, I got to move or whatever, do something, and I'm just like, oh, yeah, I'll help you out, because maybe you get a lot of people that are just like, they like to be the first one to blurt out that they'll do something or whatever, and then you just, you know, it's, it's a 50-50 coin flip, whether they can do it or not. Look, the point is, when you throw that word out there, that's debt to God. That's debt to that person. You think about it much different if you think about that it literally puts you in debt. Now you also understand how there's no small thing. Like anything that you say puts you in this type of debt. A good name is better to be chosen than, than riches and loving favor, you know, rather than silver and gold. And that's what you'll do to yourself. So Jesus says it would be better to change, to, it would be better to say nothing than to do this kind of damage to yourself. So commit to yourself tonight. Hey, just commit to yourself these two things. These two things. Just commit to yourself, I'm going to do what I say. And look, I'm telling you, point number one, I'm telling you, you will be surprised. If you have a problem with this, we all do to some degree. If you have a problem with this, just Commit to this, what Jesus said, doing these three things, silence, yes or no, and yes and no being what? Being action. That's all Jesus said. He's like, the yes is action, the no is action. Or shut up is action too. And then you owe no debt. But do that. Look, you'll be surprised. I'm telling you, you'll be surprised at what opportunity comes floating by you if you start to be that kind of person. And then, you know, number two is, you know, what Jesus said at the end. He's like, just pay your debts. Pay your debts. Pay your money debts. Don't go into a bunch of debt. Pay your money debts. And when you speak words, pay those debts. That's all you have to do. And guess what? 
I had a car payment one time 20 years ago that was $700 a month for five years, and I will never do that again. And that is what Jesus said. That's what Jesus is saying. He's like, look, if your yes is yes, and your no is no, and you operate that way, meaning your yes really means yes, like you're really helping that guy move. You're really going and making those commitments. You're really going and digging those holes. You're really making those promises to God that you were in a really tight spot and you promised God that you would do this thing and you're really following those things through. Those things are going to be hard and you're going to think about those things next time you commit to those types of debts. So it's super important that we are these type of people. Listen to what Jesus said. It's three simple options. Just pick one. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.